This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 783, recorded on June 22nd, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Daniel, I noticed that the uh, U.S. vaccination is just approaching 50% for fully vaccinated. That doesn't seem like a lot, does it? No, no. Uh, <laughs> that was my Anthony Fauci, you know, where I uh, <laughs> <laughs> I put my hand up and <laughs> shake my head. It, it it's, uh, you know, you know, so I was listening to another podcast the other day. It's one that Andy Slavitt does. Um, and uh, he he was um, interviewing uh, somebody from Facebook. And they were talking about the fact that 65% of the mis and disinformation regarding vaccines comes from 12 individuals. Yes. 12 individuals. And they just pump the stuff out. You know, and they get banned from Twitter, but then they're still on Facebook. And... Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the this active disinformation um, is is killing people, and um, you know, I was on a call with uh, United Health Group, sort of the Optum, um, one of the higher groups, and there was a lot of um, pessimism about you know the people that aren't going to get vaccinated are just not going to get vaccinated. I don't think that's true. I mean, these individuals are still spending an incredible amount of time, millions of dollars, to introduce fear, to just make stuff up about the vaccines. And uh, one of the comments, I think it was a Kaiser um, survey where they, they asked people and uh, four out of five people who are not vaccinated believe something about the vaccine that's not true. They were told something, they were misinformed. So um, yeah, we, we really have to make a difference here. Um, and a lot of it, you know, how do you get someone who's not vaccinated to get vaccinated? Number one is you listen. You stop, you take a deep breath, you listen. What are your concerns? You don't ridicule them. Um, and a lot of times they've been told something by someone and it's just not true. And um, I think we need to have patience. We need to have humility. We need to reach out to these individuals um, because I think that if they actually knew the facts, um, a large number of people would would come to the conclusion that it's not so important to be part of a tribe that you're going to put the, the lives of yourself and your loved ones um, at risk by choosing to get COVID as opposed to choosing um, a much safer option, which is the vaccines. What is the motivation of these 12 individuals who spread misinformation? Um, you know, I'm speculating, of course. Um, we do know that there's a big sort of financial incentive. Um, there's a lot of power that comes along with, uh, you know, stirring up the masses. Um, I think it was disturbing to find out, right, what happened in France where scientists were actually taking money to uh, sign letters um, it's really, you know, at some point, uh, you, you can't have a price. Your price has to be truth and honesty. Um, and I think these individuals need to look in the mirror and, uh, ask like, is that, is that blood money worth it? Are you willing to take this money? Because this is not, um, honest scientific, um, discussion. This is pure blatant misinformation. And it's, it's just wrong. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> so, cheery. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's I don't think that's political. <laughs> I feel like that's just <laughs> honesty. But anyway, so let's let's start off with two quotes from a rather impressive woman. Um and I'm going to give the quotes and then we'll be at like our 4 second pause while people see if they can remember who who said these things. The work of today is the history of tomorrow and we are its makers. And the second quotation, to be inspired is great, but to be an inspiration is an honor. Juliet Gordon Lowe. I am impressed. You don't even have daughters. <laughs> 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 um, so, yes, that was Juliet Gordon Lowe, the founder of the Girl Scouts of America. I do have a fantastic. daughter. I do have a daughter. You Holy do have a daughter? Cow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she's, she would, she, that's why I know. <laughs> Did you see there was a pause there, everyone? <laughs> it took Vincent a moment to remember. The, yeah, the daughter. yeah, I just listened to you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait a second. <laughs> All right. So yes. Um, yeah. So Juliet Gordon Lowe was the founder of Girl Scouts of America, really a tremendous organization. So um, 
Yeah. And really just a really inspiring woman. And, uh, you know, I don't know if people were aware, but the the Girl Scouts of America actually did a uh, get the vote out. Um, and now I know there's discussions about get the vaccine out, um, having Girl Scouts uh, try to help with these efforts. Um, I have two daughters. Um, you know, I, I know that right away without a pause. For instance. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, um, and they both actually went all the way through, became, uh, you know, sort of these gold star um, at the end. They did their gold awards. Um, and actually the, the last, actually Eloise's gold award was, uh, the service dog project and raising a service dog, doing the puppy rearing and then doing, uh, information sessions about it. So, um, tremendous organization, tremendous woman. And I think right now, when we look at these individuals that are not vaccinated, who, who is the most influential, uh, person? Um, it's your friend, it's your family. So reach out to your friends and family, reach out to people you care about, have honest, respectful discussions about the vaccines. Um, we, we can make a difference. We can get over this hump. Um, hundreds of people do not need to keep dying every day in the U S thousands of people do not need to keep dying around the world every day. Um, we have safe, incredibly effective vaccines. All right. So let me update on what's going on. Um, as people know, um, the trends are, are not, are not great. Um, you know, we went from a, a cruise ship of people dying per day in America down to a jumbo jet crashing every day, as far as numbers of people dying, that's not great. Um, and the numbers are going up. Um, but I will say at least in our local area, when we are seeing vaccinated people, um, get infected, it's mild. Um, it's very rare for them to end up in the hospital. It's incredibly rare for them to die, right? We're going from a one in 30 chance of death in an unvaccinated to a one in a million. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about kids here in a moment. There's a lot of fear still in the media about this. The fear should be driving people to vaccination. But once you're vaccinated, that is a very good place to be. Um, one of my friends and colleagues actually wrote a paper, uh, maybe a couple papers in the last year, Denise Brennan Ryder. She's an Irish Canadian. Um, she's also a mother. Um, and she was sharing with me recently just some of the struggles, um, you know, that she's been going through as a mom with issues with, you know, access to vaccination and concerns that her children have. Um, and uh, I just, we, we need to sort of balance. And, I, and as I talk about kids, I always say kids are at low risk, but they're not at no risk. But there, there is a balance here with all the fear. The vaccines continue to work. Even when we hear about these new variants, they continue to be very effective um, at preventing uh, serious disease, preventing hospitalization. Um, we would love if they were 100% for our herd immunity aspect, um, but that's only a small part of the story. And that should be um, sort of balanced with all the, the fear that we see in the media. So just want to sort of start with that. Um, but let's get right on to kids. And I'm going to talk about long COVID in kids because I think this is part of the metric, part of the equation um, that people are not um, considering. And I actually um, had a gentleman email me directly earlier today um, and it really sort of taken aback because his daughter's pediatrician, she's uh, an eligible adolescent, daughter's pediatrician was not really in favor of vaccination and had not recommended vaccination. So I was a bit shocked. Um, and I know sometimes people say, well, you know, only a few hundred children have died while we shut down everything. Only several thousand children ended up in the hospital. But what about kids that got COVID? How are they doing two, three months down the road? Is long COVID a significant issue in children? So we just saw the study, long-term symptoms after SARS-CoV-2 infection in children and adolescents published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. And the authors addressed a significant issue um, that we really need to know about when we're looking at return to school this fall, right? We have a lot of people saying, ah, get the kids back in school. Not a big issue if kids get COVID. Uh, I don't want my kid wearing a mask or anyone else. Well, well, we know about deaths. We know about hospitalizations. Um, what about long COVID? So this was a longitudinal cohort study investigating SARS-CoV-2 seroprevalence in 55 randomly selected schools um, in um, areas in, in Switzerland. Um, and they, they chose a linguistically and ethnically diverse population of 1.5 million residents in both urban and rural settings. So we're getting a, a nice cross-section here. Um, the investigators collected blood 
uh, for serological analysis and then used um, questionnaires to assess the symptoms. Um, they compared children who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 um, with those who tested negative uh, during a period October, November 2020. Um, ultimately, over 1,000, um, 1,355 children were included in the analysis. And what did they find? They found that the most frequently reported symptoms lasting more than 12 weeks, I just want to repeat that, 12 weeks, right? So three months after these children had been infected with COVID, 3% um, of them were still reporting that significant um, fatigue. 2% were still record, reporting difficulty concentrating. Another 2% were reporting an increased need for sleep. Um, now, there are background rates, you know, when we assess these symptoms. So just think about asking a thousand kids, you know, and there, there is sort of a background rate. Um, but overall, what they were seeing is about 4% of the serology positive children were still having symptoms three months later. So that's one in 25 kids who gets COVID is still having issues um, three months later, right? Um, symptoms consistent with long COVID. Um, so I just, I want people to think about this when you send kids back to school. Um, so let's say your, your, your child, let's say you have a daughter like Vincent now remembers and uh, she goes to class and uh, you know, there's 25 kids in the class and we say, oh, you know what? Not a big deal. We'll just let them all get COVID. It's not a big deal. One of those 25 kids is still going to be sick three months later. Um, I have to say as a parent, um, that that's too high for me, one in 25. So we look at the um, risks of vaccination. You know, we're talking about short-lived myocardial, cardiac inflammation, maybe for a couple days that gets better with over-the-counter medicine, rates of maybe one in 100,000, one in a million, things like that, um, versus one in 25 being sick for three months, having problems going to school. So I think when people talk about the risks in children, you can't just look at deaths. You can't just look at hospitalizations. It's the same as adults. You've got to look at the whole picture. And when someone um, has long COVID, uh, that's, that's a disaster. That's a tragedy in my book. Um, now, we did get some, some good news in the realm of pediatrics. Um, and this was, what about those kids who had that um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. So uh, there was a, a publication in Pediatrics, that's the official journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Longitudinal Outcomes for Multi-System Inflammatory Syndrome in Children. Um, and the authors reported on all of the 45 children um, that had been admitted to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. It's like about a block or two from where Vincent is sitting right now. Um, and at, they followed them actually out to four to nine months. And they found that basically about a month, a lot of the inflammatory markers were going down. Um, when they got far out, only one child was still having um, persistent mild dysfunction. One had mild mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. Um, but in general, the kids were getting better. So I think that is, um, that's reassuring. Um, we don't have longer term outcome, um, but the authors actually concluded the majority of children with MIS-C, so that's multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children, um, present critically ill, um, but most inflammatory and cardiac manifestations um, go on to resolve in a period of months, so rapidly. Um, so that's that's nice to know. Um, sort of, I know people have always asked what happened to these kids. Now, sticking with children here. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, came out with some recent um, guidance with a statement um, that, um, well, got a bit of press. Some people are unhappy about it. So let me go through the high points of that statement because some people are asking how do we uh, take this statement um, and mesh it with what we're hearing from the CDC as we're looking at school opening. So the first part is in line. Um, American Academy of Pediat Pediatrics is saying all eligible individuals should receive the COVID-19 vaccine. So uh, that pediatrician, I'm not sure what uh, professional organization he gets his guidance from, but the American Academy of Pediatrics is recommending um, that we go ahead and um, vaccinate all the eligible information. Um, the other is, and this is the thing that was controversial, all students older than two years and all school staff should wear face masks at school unless medical or developmental conditions prohibit use. 
why. Um, so they do, I think they knew that this would get some feedback. So they go ahead and they give us um, five reasons. So they, the AAP recommends universal, ma universal masking in school at this time for the following five reasons. One, a significant portion of the student population is not eligible for vaccination. So I think that's something. Um, second, protection of unvaccinated students from COVID-19 um, and to reduce transmission. Um, this is sort of coupled with the fact that we do not have a system to monitor the vaccine status among the students, the teachers, and staff. Um, and I think um, we've all had that experience. You know, you go you go into a supermarket in an area where maybe 50% of the people are vaccinated, but no one's wearing a mask because people who are vaccinated don't need to wear masks. Well, people who are unvaccinated have got the masks off too. So they're pointing that out. There's there's really no good system for knowing who's vaccinated and enforcing, um, you know, masks only for the vaccinated, unvaccinated. Um, point three. Um, potential, and this ties right in, potential difficulty in monitoring or enforcing mass policies for those who are not vaccinated. Um, the ability of schools, and this is right in the same, to have consistent messaging, expectations, enforcement, and compliance um, without needing to try to monitor vaccination status. Um, four, and this is sort of relates to the community, right? The biggest risk for a child is what's going on in the community around the school. Schools are often safer than the environment around. Um, and so the AAP says the possibility of low vaccination uptake within the surrounding school community. Um, and then finally five, and, and this um, we'll be touching on as we go further, continued concerns for variants that are more easily spread among children, adolescents, and adults. So they've, they've got their recommendation for face masks at school, and they've got their explanation for why they're saying that. All right. Now, pre-exposure testing, right? So testing, never miss an opportunity to test. Now, I know when I talked about some of the other guidance, part of the school reopening guidance is having testing strategies. Um, but I'm excited that we have some data now to understand what's going on potentially with transmission um, with the Delta variant. What is going on? Is it spreading faster? What, what's, what are the kinetics here? What's happening? So we got an interesting publication, viral infection and transmission in a large well-traced outbreak caused by the Delta SARS-CoV-2 variant. Um, and this was published by a group that was looking at um, cases in China. Now, I've talked a bit about how sloppy the word transmissible is, um, and that when we hear that a certain virus, um, certain variant is uh, becoming dominant, we really need to understand the mechanism behind this variant's fitness advantage. And I think that this paper was a step in the right direction. Um, so did we get any answers? Well, the authors investigated um, data from quarantine subjects in this Delta variant outbreak and compared it to previous 2020 epidemic um, outbreaks caused by earlier variants. So a couple questions that they tried to address. One, is there a shorter reproductive time? So let me explain a little bit about what I mean by that. So you get exposed to someone who has SARS-CoV-2 um, infection, who has COVID-19, who is contagious. You have your exposure event. Um, now, what is the time from exposure till you test positive or till you test positive and have enough virus that you can transmit it to the next individual. Um, so this is the time from infection to becoming PCR positive and being able to give the virus to the next person, sort of a nuance of that. Um, now their results showed that the time interval from exposure to first PCR positivity in the quarantine population um, was four days versus six days. So six days was what we saw back in the 2020 and now we're seeing four days. So that's an interesting issue. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about whether our experience meshes with this. Um, the other thing that they saw, and I think this needs to be taken in context, that first positive test that they were seeing was a thousand times higher as far as the RNA copy number. So what we think we're seeing here is from zero at day four, people are already PCR positive, but they're already at a level of virus that makes them contagious. Now, when we talked about day six turning PCR positive, usually at day six, they were PCR positive, but at a high CT value, so a high cycle threshold, 
low level of virus, not quite transmitting. So you could pull them out before they spread it to the next person. Usually it was day seven that they were contagious. So instead of seven days from exposure to spreading to the next person, this may be shortened to only four days. So we're, we're thinking that there is a more rapid rise from negative to infectious. Um, people have looked at that thousand times higher, and I want to point out that's just looking at the first positive test. That's not the peak. We don't have the area under the curve. We did not follow these people every single day to see whether there's been a change in the duration at high levels. So the area under the curve, the period that they might become infectious. Um, and, and I've sort of been asking, does this really mesh with our experience? And you know, one of the things our listeners may know is we do these large screening programs for the, the movie industry, where we test thousands of people every night with the idea that we're gonna catch them early when they first get positive, and then we've got this day before they become infectious. So someone tests positive on a Wednesday night. Um, usually it's a high CT value. We say, that's great, we grab you, we pull you out. We've been doing this for over a year without having any issues. What we're now seeing, unfortunately, is we're seeing a lot of people testing positive. Um, the concern is when they test positive that night, they may have already been infectious in the latter half of the day. When we're talking to our outpatient providers, when someone says, boy, I felt crummy for about a day, so I decided to finally get tested. Now you get them a PCR test. There's a 36 hour resulting delay. You call them and you say, John, your test is positive. We gotta figure out who you may have exposed. When you test those people that they've exposed, those people are already positive and they're already positive at high level. So this data is, is meshing with our experience. And as you can imagine, this really challenges our Tetris, our contact tracing paradigm. If by the time you tell someone that they're PCR positive, everyone they've exposed is also already PCR positive at a contagious level, it's already sort of spread to the next tier and it's kind of a, a dominoes type um, phenomenon. So this is one paper, this is meshing with our experience, but we need more data to help us with this because this is a problem. If it is a shorter incubation time, shorter from time to exposure to spreading, um, that could explain a lot of what we're seeing. It also is really relevant to how we're gonna address this. If I may, Jump in. I was I was hoping that my dramatic pause would get you pulled in, Vincent. Just two things. First, yes. so the shorter serial interval, that's what this is, that could account for a more rapid spread, but it doesn't mean the virus is more transmissible intrinsically. It just reproduces faster and therefore can go from one host to another quicker. And as you said, uh, people are infectious sooner, and that can result in more people being infected as a consequence. That's possible. But I would say it's not intrinsic greater transmissibility of the virus. Um, and then I, I agree we need more data on that. The other issue is the PCR, a thousand times, that might not be infectious virus. So I think that some point people need to do infectious virus measurements. We have to stop depending on PCR because I can imagine a variant throws off more mRNAs and that's going to show up positive in the PCR, but it's not infectious virus. So that yeah. nobody has done that for any of the variants yet. And I'm a little bit frustrated at that. Yeah, no, and I, and I share your frustration. And I think that this is really, from my point, this is, you can't just use the word transmissible. You always say, what are you talking about? Because... Um, if it's a shorter incubation period, so many of our rules about, you know, when you contact trace, how long a person is, we, we need to know the, the kinetics of infectious viable virus um, for all the variants. We need to keep doing the research. We can't say, oh, we've got this for the, you know, because um, this, is, this is a problem. Um, and I think also people have probably seen the Olympics when people are quote unquote testing positive. Um, what does that mean? Are they having a low level of RNA positivity? Do they actually have viable infectious virus? Do we need to pull Olympic athletes who've been vaccinated and are young and healthy out for 10 days? Because that's what we did, you know, a year ago. Um, yeah, we need, we, we can't be sloppy with our language because it matters. It affects, uh, it affects what we do. It affects people. All right. Active vaccination, um, never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Vaccination is how this pandemic ends and no one is safe until we're all safe. 
Um, and I know I get a lot of questions, actually seem like I got a lot more this week, and I'm not sure if it's that we're hitting a particular population, um, but they want to know, um, you know, if I had a COVID-19 um, before, if I had a natural infection, um, do I really need to get vaccinated? Um, maybe I'm just okay. And so I'm just going to take a little aside to, um, you know, I think all the clinicians that are getting these questions, I'll, I'm going to answer it for all of you. Um, we, we do have information on this topic in three forms. So this is, I had COVID-19, do I need to get vaccinated? Um, so one, um, we have a number of the serology and T cell studies, right? Um, there was that nice paper in Cell that we discussed back in uh, June, reduced neutralization of SARS-CoV-2 B1617 by vaccine and convalescent serum, right? Because people really are now asking about the Delta variant. Um, you know, and we've talked a little bit about neutralizing antibody convalescent plasma. Um, we also had... Um, reduced sensitivity of SARS-CoV-2 variant Delta to antibody neutralization published in Nature. Um, and that was just this month. Both papers suggesting convalescent plasma was about four times less potent um, against the Delta variant. Um, but if we've discussed many times, we don't really know, you know what, what that translates into. Um, and we really sort of think that T cells are important. Um, so we have some information on T cells um, in the paper immunological memory to SARS-CoV-2 assessed for up to eight months after infection. Um, this is by uh, Shane Crotty and Aless Alessandro Setti's group, and this was in Science. Um, but, um, you know, here there's a couple things that we saw, um, and I'm, I'm going to throw in words like only <laughs> to sort of emphasize things. Um, only 70% of individuals possessed detectable CD8 positive T cell memory at one month after infection. That declined to 50% by six to eight months after infection. Um, not great, but CD4 uh, T cell memory. 93% um, of subjects had detectable SARS-CoV-2 memory at a month after infection, and this remained high for six to eight months. Um, so we, we also see um, T follicular helper cells being maintained. So we're sort of getting mixed here. Um, now, we did have the preprint also by these same uh, gentlemen, low-dose mRNA-1273 COVID-19 vaccine generates durable T-cell memory and antibodies enhanced by pre-existing cross-reactive T-cell memory, um, where they report that spike um, CD8-positive T-cells were generated in 88% of subjects uh, with equivalent percentages of CD8 positive T cell memory responders at six months post vaccine. Um, so you're sort of seeing here that there looks like when we're looking at these um, lab based studies of B cells, T cells, and serology, vaccines do look like they're a little bit better, and we have good data on the efficacy. Um, we also have the reinfection studies. That's sort of when the rubber meets the road. What happens when people have had natural infection and now they're exposed again? Um, and I think we discussed before the SIREN study out of England, and that was SARS-CoV-2 infection rates of antibody positive compared with antibody negative healthcare workers in England, a large multi-center prospective cohort study, SIREN. Um, and here, this was Lancet, uh, suggesting a median duration effect of seven months um, at about 83% from prior infection with the same variant, right? So um, sort of raises concerns. And then we have this growing experience. What, what, are, what are we seeing as clinicians? And, and we are seeing our own growing experience of people who were infected early in the pandemic, so a year or more ago, um, now coming in, testing PCR positive, um, having symptoms, and some of them not doing well. I, I think I may have shared the experience of the young woman who had long COVID after her first infection, did not get a vaccine. And, you know, a couple of weeks ago, she started to get ill again and again um, had a second infection. And I think now people ask, oh, can you test to see if it's a Delta variant? Well, it's um, almost 90% of the, of the sequences we're now seeing across the country are Delta variant. So um, I think that, um, you know, the, the data may not be as compelling as some of the anti-vaccinators or the hesitant might want to be, um, but we have really good compelling data on the safety and efficacy of vaccines. So we are across the board recommending that all people get vaccinated, even if they had prior infection. All right. Um, 
Now, the period of detectable viral replication, this, this is going to be an exciting part. I'm looking for some uh, emails. Uh, we had some very disturbing news, right? So this is the time for monitoring and monoclonals, not the time for antibiotics. Um, but there was a bit of drama because a preprint that had been posted um, suggesting that a randomized control trial demonstrated a 90% reduction in mortality and substantial in ivermectin-treated patients may have been something that never happened. So um, a London medical student uh, named Jack Lawrence was the Woodward and Bernstein in this story, if people remember all the president's men. Um, and he was investigating this preprint, and he discovered initially that the introductory section of the document appeared to have been almost entirely plagiarized and then run through a thesaurus program. And it, it appears that the authors, um, they, they pulled entire paragraphs out of press releases and, and websites about ivermectin, um, and then they changed these key words. The data appears to have been completely falsified. The tables in the article, mathematically impossible. Apparently, the study never happened. They just invented the study, invented the data, um, put it out there. Really, just a case of scientific fraud. Um, so, you know, th this data was part of a lot of these meta analyses where people were saying, ooh, ivermectin, it looks so promising. It's a crime to humanity that we're not using it when there's this study with a 90% mortality reduction. Um, you know, my hope is that all the people that have embraced ivermectin and are using it um, based on this kind of data will rethink their position and embrace the importance of honest scientific investigation. Um, so um, now if someone, if someone is passionate about ivermectin and they, they, they want to know, um, don't just make up data. Don't just invent a study and put a preprint. Um, right now, um, and we've talked a little bit about this, Active 6 um, the COVID-19 study of repurposed medications is recruiting to properly study ivermectin, fluvoxamine, and fluticasone. So if you're passionate, if you're excited about ivermectin, you know, either enroll, direct your patients this way. Um, we, we need good science. Don't just make up science. All right. <laughs> um, a uh, little more information on the reliability of point-of-care rapid testing with the Abbott Binex Now with the publication of Multidisciplinary Assessment of the Abbott Binex Now SARS-CoV-2 Point-of-Care Antigen Test in the Context of Emerging Viral Variants and Self-Administration. Uh, it was published in Nature Scientific Reports. Um, and I know a lot of people, I get, you know, at least every day, hey, do our tests still work against the Delta variant? Um, you know, and I've talked a little bit about, you know, how it may go from these low level to um, high levels in hours instead of a day plus. Um, and so what the authors here looked at the Binex now. Um, they looked at the Quidel Sophia 2 SARS test. They looked at the BD Veritor. They were all 100% concordant with RT-PCR with CT values of less than 20. Um, and then they started to lose sensitivity um, at higher CT values, or we translate that into lower RNA levels. Um, so just a reminder, CT stands for cycle threshold. This is how many times you've got to run that PCR or that amplification before you um, get a positive signal. Um, the higher the number of cycles, the lower uh, amount of RNA that you started with. And as Vincent likes to point out, that's just RNA. That doesn't necessarily tell us about infectious virus. Um, all right. And I think there's a correlation more in time than levels. So that's important. Um, but what about this? You know, I, I, get, I get calls all the time. Um, you know, is there one rapid test better than the other? Um, and there are a lot of publications that come out. It seems like every time a publication comes out, I get a question. Um, and just to give some context here, there are over 300 COVID-19 tests and collection kits authorized by the FDA, over 200 molecular tests. We have 11 antigen tests. Um, what, what about this? So the specificity, right? People say, oh, well, not only are they less sensitive, but they're less specific. If I get a positive on an antigen, I don't trust it as much. Um, I'm going to say that if you get a positive test, the specificity of antigen tests is generally as high as our nucleic acid amplif amplification tests, which means that a positive test 
um, on an antigen test is as reliable as a positive test on a PCR. Um, there's a lot of experience, right? But just uh, remember your prevalence of the community is going to help you interpret whether that positive test makes sense or, or not. Now, what about sensitivity? Really straightforward. This is related to the amount of antigen that is present. If it's the first couple days, that one to three days, that corresponds with a CT value of less than 20. As pointed out, we're getting sensitivities. We're getting concordance right up there at about 100%. Once you get out to day seven, day eight, when that RNA level is dropping, when you're not really having much in the way of antigen, these tests are going to turn negative. So they're actually helpful when you think about what it's testing for. These are great at picking up that infectious period of time. They correspond with the infectious period of time. PCRs can sometimes stay positive for weeks, for months. All right. Um, and there was a really nice, I'm going to say, Cochrane review, which they keep updating. Rapid point-of-care antigen and molecular-based test for diagnosis of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, this is a 409-page document, so a nice light read. Um, and it goes through different tests, their sensitivity and specificity at different CT levels. Um, and so it's, a, it's an excellent document. So don't let that latest publication, you know, shake your shake your earth, um, go ahead, look at this accumulation of data, rapid point of care antigen tests have a role, that testing delay is leaving someone who's potentially infectious wandering around spreading it to others. All right, another article um, on, it describes that water is wet, <laughs> as Mark Grissop likes to say. Uh, this is how antibacterial therapy is not helpful for the treatment of a virus. And this is, this is the article, Effect of Oral Azithromycin Versus Placebo on COVID-19 Symptoms in Outpatients with SARS-CoV-2 Infection, a Randomized Control Trial, published in JAMA. Um, and I think this is interesting. Some people think that, well, maybe the azithromycin will make my patient feel a little bit better. It does not. You're just, uh, you know, inducing antibacterial resistance. So they did not see that antibiotics help viral infections. All right. Um, we're getting near the end. So long COVID, right? Um, I mentioned last time that uh, post-acute COVID syndrome, apparently when you're on a call with the CDC, they don't like the word, they don't like the phrase long COVID. They, they feel happier when you say PAX. Um, but I like long COVID because I think it actually uh, points to something within the larger world of PAX, of post-acute COVID syndromes. Um, but what about the rest of the world? We talked about the US and the UK. So we did see the article, Post-Discharge Symptoms Among Hospitalized COVID-19 Patients in Nigeria, a single center study published in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Um, and basically um, what they were pointing out is this was a small study, but the majority of their discharged patients were actually having um, symptoms um, continuing for months after discharge. Um, I know a lot of people, um, you know, we're very focused on the U.S., but outside the U.S., things continue to be really difficult. Um, there was a nice paper, um, COVID-19 Therapeutics for Low- and Middle-Income Countries, a review of candidate agents with potential for near-term use and impact. Um, and this was, there was actually... Um, you know, wh I think what you would expect, you've got to think about the resources in the area relative, um, you know, injectable tools, expensive therapies are not going to be able to play as big a part in this um, area. Um, and there was actually a nice um, article, um, COVID-19 in Africa, um, a lesson in solidarity published in Lancet. Actually, my friend, Dr. Titus Diwali from Malawi um, brought this to my attention. Um, but just pointing out, you can't just send vaccines to these countries. Um, the same complexity applies there. You've got to have needles. You've got to have syringes. You've got to have trained people. And you actually have vaccine hesitancy and an interest in education in these areas, just like you do in um, the United States, in Western Europe, in many parts of the world. So to get those vaccines into arms um, is going to require a pretty large effort. Um, and I actually made Vincent record this a little earlier today because I'm going to be talking with the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates um, Foundation COVID-19 Task Force later to talk a little bit about these challenges. So um, as I like to say, we are not safe until everyone is safe. 
Um, and to conclude on that note, um, just a couple weeks left here um, for our campaign to support Foundation International Medical Relief of Children. So go to Parasites Without Borders um, before the end of July. We will double your donation. We're going to try to get up to um, a level where we can double that $20,000 and give a full $40,000 to support Foundation International Medical Relief of Children's efforts throughout the world. Daniel, when I went to the uh, our new office this week, I walked in and the lady shouted, Parasites is here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. All right. Time for some questions for Daniel. You can send yours to Daniel at microbe.tv. Kevin writes, his favorite public speakers are Barack Obama and Dr. Daniel Griffin. <laughs> okay. All right, he has a question about his grandfather's immunization status. In February, he got mRNA vaccine. Four days later, tested positive for COVID. Thanks to your advocacy, I, I got him monoclonal therapy. Uh, infection passed. My grandfather had only mild disease. Following CDC recommendation, he waited three months before getting the second dose of the mRNA vaccine. Last time we checked, CDC recommendation for someone in the same circumstances does not need to restart the vaccine Schedule. However, we're a little concerned that perhaps his first dose did not prime his immune system as well. What are your thoughts? We'd like to think he's well immunized uh, uh, after natural infection and at least one good dose of mRNA vaccine, but we're not completely confident. Yeah. Um, so this is a great question. I, I suspect we're in a good in a good situation here, right? Um, there was a period of time, at least, where the immune system was learning from that first infection before um, the monoclon monoclonals jumped in there. Um, that is the current recommendation. Um, you know, there's also there's a science and there's an equity side to this, right? Where you know, should we be giving third doses to people when so much of the world hasn't even had their first dose? Um, so a situation like this, you're probably in good shape. Um, what we have sometimes done um, is if there's doses that, you know, might end up in the trash because we've had a no-show, an individual like this might look at the whole picture and try to make a decision there relative to that. But no, this is the recommendation. We, we think that this individual is, is protected, um, definitely a lot better protected than someone who has had no vaccination. Frank writes, why do you not mention the use of daily rapid tests at school as a high quality method eliminating COVID without restricting socialization? A dollar per student per day is not a burden. If the answer is waiting for FDA approval and high volume manufacturing, we need to know that and put more pressure on representatives. No, so, um, and actually when I've talked about schools and camps, rapid testing, actually testing, um, can be a really important part of your multi-layered approach to keeping the kids safe. Um, one of the things I will throw, and I think this is important as a thought experiment, right? Um, let's say you're, you've got all these layers of protection, you want, you're looking to try to get those masks off, right? So those kids can be in person, in school with masks off. Let's say you have a breakdown, and in that class of 25 individuals, you miss, right, because you know, the sensitivity of the test. Uh, someone comes in on a Monday, it's negative. You test Tuesday, they're positive. You realize, okay, um, if everyone's wearing masks, you may not have had an exposure event. You may have actually been able to avoid that. You may be able to move forward with only that one person coming out of the school. So you got to sort of balance this issue. Is wearing masks such a burden that you're willing to take the risk of exposure events and all those um, implications? Or are you okay wearing masks in certain settings? So should there be a failure of your layers that you're not pulling everyone out for the quarantine and everything that sort of follows from that? And um, Laura from New Mexico writes, as COVID infections continue to rise, is it advisable for a fully vaccinated person who ends up with an infection to get monoclonal antibody treatment? I live in a somewhat Medically underserved area, keep notes on the recommended treatment approaches. Should I need to be an advocate for myself or a loved one? My immediate family and the majority of my regular contacts are fully vaccinated, but I want to be prepared for the uptick in cases that is starting. Yeah, it is. The, um, the role of monoclonals is not impacted by prior vaccination. So if an individual who has uh, risk factors for progressing to severe disease does test positive, go right ahead with the, with the monoclonals. Um, remember, the, the vaccines are great. Um, but nothing's 100%. We have had a few hundred people, so it's a one in a million um, chance of dying if you get COVID. Um, we've also had some people, I hate to say, at least there are reports of individuals who got infected after vaccine, ended up in the hospital or got long COVID. 
go ahead, get the monoclonals. Uh, there's no reason not to. They're sitting on shelves. They're paid for by the government. Um, so go ahead. And that's COVID-19 clinical update number 72 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone be safe. 